Today we're going to delve deep into one of my favourite TV actors of all time, Matthew Perry. Matthew Perry is a nice guy and his latest autobiography proves it. And he might in fact be the ultimate model for certain nice guys like myself. In this video we're going to explore the lessons that we can take from his life as recovering nice guys. So his autobiography, which I've almost finished reading, is called Friends, Lovers and the Big Terrible Thing. The big terrible thing being addiction, friends being friends, the TV program, and lovers being his uh, insatiable appetite for sex. And I'm not going to ruin it. I want you to read the book for yourself. If you're a nice guy in recovery, I think it's an excellent book to read just to get an insider view of other nice guys, how they function and what you might see in yourself. Uh, but in general, the book focuses primarily on his drug addiction and his intimacy issues. And this is on a background of super fame and wealth. So we get to see what it's like to be a nice guy when you're also like one of the most famous people in the world and have so much money you couldn't possibly spend it all or lose it. Matthew Perry is special in my life because Chandler Bing is me. I even did a little emphasis there. You know, when I saw Friends for the first time back in the 90s, I guess it was, you know, I was just really emerging into my nice guy persona that was about to throttle me and take over my life. And I was Chandler. Really, like, I had friends who joked about how I was Chandler. You know, I was the sarcastic, witty one. I never let an awkward silence go by without cracking a joke. I couldn't let anything serious happen without breaking the tension with a joke. With a joke. I was terrible with women, terrible with sex and intimacy, but everybody loved me and nobody could figure out why I struggled so much. Uh, and I was just, I was him. I was the New Zealand version of him. And so, you know, I, as soon as I saw that Matthew Perry had written a book, I was like, oh, I've got to read this fucking book. Like, this is my guy. I want to, you know, there's no way somebody could act as Chandler without knowing what it's like to be Chandler, you know? And, so I, I knew instinctively, without knowing anything about Matthew Perry, that he must actually be a lot of Chandler in real life. He must be a nice guy, an approval seeker, someone with intimacy issues in real life. He just, he understood it so well. When I saw Chandler, I just felt so understood. I felt like somebody had written me into a TV series and then made, Americanized it. And that was it. But the person who was acting me had studied me intently. Chandler, Matthew Perry himself, and I, we're all performer types of nice guys. Now, I've got a piece of content on different types of nice guys. You can message me, dan at brojo.org, if you want to see that. It's a very in-depth content covering the four or five different types of nice guys. But the performer type, uh, generally, we're extroverted. We have an avoidant attachment issue, all right? We don't like people getting close. We're approval seekers, so we get our approval deliberately. We put on a show. That's why I call it the performer type, as opposed to those who get approval by trying to avoid disapproval, which is much more kind of passive. Uh, we go and get approval. We make you like us. You know, we control people's emotions through manipulation, humor being a primary manipulator. But we have other things, you know, we're good at arguing, convincing people and selling things. We hide all negative emotions and experiences. And Matthew talks about this in his book, like, most of the time, nobody had any idea that anything was wrong with him, even though he was in very dire straits with his addiction. Um, we self-medicate because we're independent. So because we're avoidant types, we don't like letting anyone in. We don't like getting help from anybody else. Uh, so if we were to have a mental health issue, we're going to sort it out ourselves. And like Perry, I self-medicated. I've done a fair few amount of drugs in my time. I think I'm lucky that I've never had the kind of drugs he had, which are more like the prescription uh, opiate type medications. Uh, actually, I just got out of hospital and one night I was really in pain there after my surgery and they gave me a pill that was exactly the experience that Matthew Perry was talking about. You know, your blood turns into warm honey. It's just a sense of well-being uh, that's unmatched by anything else. Uh, not the same as ecstasy, which is like a loving feeling. This one's more sort of self-centered. You just feel like warm and cozy all by yourself. And, uh, you know, after they gave me that pill, I told them, don't give me any more pills like that. Like, I'm not the right person to have those kind of pills. Luckily, I'm strong enough now. But 
you know, 15 years ago, if I had had surgery and had a pill like that, I would have been like, how do I get more of those pills, you know? But, you know, my drugs were primarily weed and ecstasy and speed and stuff like that. And I don't have what he had. He, he has an addictive thing in him. He's a thing where he becomes addicted. I don't have that. I've always been able to wean myself off stuff. I've quit cigarettes, alcohol, weed. They're all hard to quit, but not that hard. Whereas he really seems to struggle. I consider myself lucky that I never pursued acting because I have a sense that I would have been good at it. And if I had been and got as famous as Matthew Perry had, I think my story would be the same as his. And if you read the book, it's, it's not a good story. I'm lucky I didn't stumble upon the type of performing that would have elevated me to superstardom. You know, I, I was in a band and I was funny with my friends. I considered stand-up comedy for a little while. Maybe that would have been a similar path. But I ended up sort of doing it with achievements and stuff in other fields. And probably just because I was born and raised in New Zealand, which is very anti-emotional, I never got into acting because it would have been seen as, you know, soft. And I wanted to always be seen as hard. Whereas, you know, Matthew was growing up in a, an environment where acting was applauded. He lived in LA as a, as a young man. So I feel now lucky that I never went into acting because I think that would have been a tragedy for me. I think I would have been good at it, and I think uh, if I'd done well, if I'd got to like being on TV level, doing well, it would have just been drugs and mayhem for me as well, you know? So I'm glad I missed out on that, even though I was, I was so sure I wanted it for a long time. So Matthew Perry clearly talks about being avoidant yet needy. This horrible combination for the performer type of nice guy where we, we end up engaging in this constant push and pull. Through performing, we like to be the center of attention. We like to get lots of laughs. We like to be the cause of other people feeling good. We like people to say that we're the funniest person they ever met, or the nicest guy that they've ever met, or oh, you got to have, you got to meet Dan. He's fucking awesome. Nothing wrong with him. We like people to think that way about us, but at the same time, we have to resist intimacy and commitment. We don't want people to get deep. We don't want it to get real. We don't want ugliness. We don't want confrontation. We don't want you know, difficult conversations about how we really feel about things. So we're constantly trying to keep people at just the right distance. Like, love me, but don't get anywhere near me, you know? And I think being a famous TV star is just a brilliant way to achieve that goal, you know? Everywhere you go, you're loved, but nobody knows you. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. And he unfortunately for him found that perfect nice guy hole to start digging he even mentions in the book talking about having erectile dysfunction which is very common uh, for us performer type nice guys because we get performance anxiety and uh, we're always wanting to put on a good performance so even in the bedroom even for our first time we want to blow them away which is ridiculous now he got over his very quickly because he had a partner that was understanding me, it took me many, many years to get over mine because I had a few partners who weren't. You know, us, us performer nice guys, we think fame and wealth to a lesser extent, but more so fame, would solve all our problems. That, you know, that would finally be the kind of the bare tap of approval with the keg that never runs dry. Uh, but all it does is feed the monster. The problem with actually being funny is that if you're good at it, you then you get the validation and it's like being good at buying drugs it just means you're going to get more addicted you're going to get more drugs you know the best thing for being a drug addict is that you don't have access to drugs that nobody wants to sell them to you it's the only way you're going to get clean and it's the same with being a performer type if nobody thinks you're particularly entertaining and you get bad reviews and nobody laughs at your jokes then maybe you won't do it so much and therefore you won't feed that nice guy approval seeking monster and maybe find some other way to live but Perry, he never got a chance to find another way to live because he found the eternal tap of approval. So what's interesting, you might think, oh, Chandler from Friends, he must be fucking crushing it. But no, he suffers more than most people around the whole world, despite his wealth. Um, drugs and alcohol have almost killed him multiple times. He lives in a prison inside his mind, where most of the time he's suffering. The only time he's not suffering is when he is using and when he's using, he's actually suffering even worse. It just comes to bite him later. I mean, he has really almost died multiple times by his account. He's become very close. He's been in a lot of physical pain. He has permanent injuries, 
both mental and physical from all his using uh he does not enjoy many minutes of the day he doesn't know if he even really likes people he feels does feels disconnected from everyone he's not winning so his relentless need for approval and his avoidance of intimacy his fear that letting people in will hurt him because it hurt him as a child because people close to him hurt him as a child it's isolated him and prevented him from achieving normality see for the nice guy performer type normality is the solution you know we need to have a basic as middle of the pack life in order to be healthy we can't be high performers we can't we can't survive at the top with all the attention and everything just like a drug addict cannot survive in a house full of heroin you know they need to be a place where they don't have access to it they need to humble themselves and, and that's what guys like me and matthew perry need we need to just live out a regular life that's how we're going to be healthy and confident and he actually mentions this i haven't finished the book so maybe it ends there somewhere but he mentions just the idea of kind of like pottering around the garden and stuff and how there's something brilliant in there there's a there's a clue there as he would say from god that this is how you're supposed to live so the greatest lesson i think from the chan le bing character which is really just an extension of perry is that using humor to get approval you've got to see that for what it is it is a coping mechanism for abandonment trauma and all it does is create more isolation you end up causing more of the problem that you're trying to solve you know if you know anyone or you are someone who's funny all the time always got a joke always cracking never serious i guarantee you that person is severely traumatized that is not healthy functioning. Being humorous, you know, having a light-hearted view of the world and occasionally cracking off a good joke and just kind of seeing things in the most playful light, that's not the same thing. Being funny, being entertainingly funny all the time, that's the thing you got to watch out for. That's a huge red flag. That's somebody who's not doing well psychologically. And nobody knows it because they look like they're doing exceptionally well psychologically. They're always having a laugh. They must be doing well, right? No, it's a perfect mask. There's nothing but pain under there. Now, they, they will laugh and have a good time because it's also their medication. But when the laughter stops and they're left alone with their thoughts, it is pure hell. I know this from experience and so does Matthew. Taken to the extreme, the pain of that disconnection, that isolation of feeling like an alien amongst a different species, it's so great that drugs are the only way to get over it the only way to numb it you know for me it was like ecstasy was the only thing and speed the only thing that got me to fucking actually say what i'm really thinking and feel like i'm part of the group feel like i'm with people other drugs like alcohol actually used to only uh, emphasize that i felt like i was different to others but i just didn't care as much and weed of course let me just kind of giggle and just you know numb the pain until bedtime and he uses drugs as for similar reasons. It's kind of, I can't handle how fucking alone I am and the crazy thoughts go through my head. So there's a pill that stops that from happening. That'll do, you know, which of course, when you're on drugs all the time, when you're high, you're not connected to anyone. It's not real. You know, I used to love the conversations I'd have with people on ecstasy because they're just so real and honest and transparent. And the next day I wouldn't remember it at all. And I wouldn't feel any more connected to the other person. It'd be like we just reset overnight. It wasn't real. I didn't even consider back then that I could have those conversations without getting high and that it, the connection would last if I wasn't. You know, when you look at Friends, Chandler Bing clearly suffered more than any other character on the show. And I think that's a real accurate portrayal. You know, the other characters, for all their various foibles and flaws, uh, they all had backbones, they were all assertive. They were happy to disappoint the crowd in order to do what was right and so on and so forth. And they therefore they suffered less. And I think that's a great uh, critique of nice guy syndrome. You know, and, and if you watch the whole series, I'm actually a big Friends fan. I know some people hate it. I fucking love it. And I've watched it multiple times. And, and at the end, Channel Bing calms down a bit, which actually Matthew Perry talks about the drug use happening behind that. And so on but the last couple of seasons you know perry puts on a bit of weight Chandler bing becomes this kind of like settled in husband who's just relaxed a bit more and he's not so fucking like this all the time and doing his little whoa fucking 
double takes and all that. He's just kind of chill. He's still got that sarcastic wit, but it's much more like relaxed and kind of dad humor. Uh, and he's, there's so many more moments where he's being intimate and honest and real and assertive and stuff. And you see him kind of heal. You know, and it's tragic to think that the real Matthew Perry behind that was not going through that same transition, that this Chandler Bing character was now, if anything, far from Matthew Perry. So once he accepted a normal life and committed to a loving partner and just found a job that was right for him rather than the one that was easy and all that, he found peace and he found confidence. Chandler Bing, that is. He found his balls along the way, he stepped up and you know, gave up the easy, funny path for the more sort of serious but real and authentic path. He stopped being as funny as well. Did you notice that the, at the end, you know, at the start of Friends, the first few seasons, Chandler's the funny one, the funniest one. Um, at least the one who's actually attempting to be funny. You might laugh at Ross more, but, you know, by the end of it, Chandler just sort of fades into the background and he's not the funniest one anymore. He's not the star of the show anymore. And that's actually a sign that he's getting healthy, you know, if that was a real world. You know, it was one of the signs for me getting healthy was not being the funniest guy in the room anymore and not being the center of attention and not being the smartest or the best at anything and just being like an average dude who doesn't know what he's really doing and just kind of potters around trying to do something he enjoys and speaks his mind and just lets the chips fall where they may. Like, for me, I used to think being a, like married with a kid and you know, the white picket house, I used, that used to be my nightmare. I couldn't think of a more horrible thing than their mundane existence. And now I realized I was shying away from my own heaven. You know, this, this is where I should be. This is peaceful. You know, I've got my problems, don't get me wrong, but I don't have this need to impress people all the time. I'm, I'm not constantly living and dying on the approval of others. I don't feel this urge to be funny all the time. I can have serious, long, in-depth conversations and have deep connections with people. And that's way better. I'd rather go to my grave unknown, but happy, than to be a big star who wants to fucking die all the time. So, but it's hard. It's like an ego thing. I have to let go of like being the star I think I could have been, being the big deal that I probably could have been if I just pushed it and just went in the right direction, maybe took up acting. Who knows? Maybe I'm delusional. But, you know, when I read Chandler, and I'm going to do another piece on Will Smith based on his book as well, when I read these guys who actually went in that direction and went all in at being the man and being the funny one and being the successful one, I'm so glad I didn't do it. They fucking, it was a disaster. Awful. They suffered endlessly. So I haven't finished the book, so hopefully it arcs around to some sort of happy ending for, for Perry. But if anything else, I hope, Perry himself can learn from the Chandler Bing of friends and see that bit at the end where he settles down, just has a family and does some like unimpressive but enjoyable thing for a living. You know, that, that life, that's the answer. Maddie, if you're watching this, which you definitely aren't, that's the answer, mate. That's the solution. Thank you all for watching. I hope it was helpful. Get in touch, dan at brojo.org if you'd like to recover from nice guy syndrome alongside me. And I'll see you guys next time.